Pozdravujeme všetkých našich poslucháčov a divákov. Na úvod opäť jedna prozba. Tieto podcasty sú otvorené úplne pre všetkých a sú bezplatné. Prosím je vás teda o vašu podporu a do konca mesiaca je naše predplatné so zľavou 50% s kódom Ozdravome 2024. Jedna veľká zmena v tomto podcaste a ospravedlňujeme sa tým, ktorí nemajú až tak dobrú angličtinu, nevrejím, že ja ju mám. A dnešný celý podcast bude v angličtine a hádam sa nám potári doplniť aj titulky. So I'm switching to English now. Uh, with me is Michael Cannon from the Cato Institute and we will be talking about, uh, about many things, but uh, the, the prior, prior topic is of course healthcare. But since you are here and you are from the United States and the uh, US uh, presidential elections are coming, so the main f- concern of, of many people in Europe is Trump going to win. The problem with elections is that someone always wins. Yeah. And the amazing thing about the Democratic Party in the United States is that they keep picking candidates who make Donald Trump look, look uh, re- not reasonable, uh, not, e- not better by comparison, but uh, who a lot of American voters think make look Donald make Donald Trump look good by comparison. Um and you know Joe Biden beat Donald Trump soundly in 2020. Uh uh but it's not clear that he's going to be able to do that this time around for various reasons. And so uh you know I don't have a prediction but uh it is just remarkable to me how how poor the choices are. Uh, for president in the United States. Many Republicans that I know, they are also never Trumpers. And the reason why they uh, they told me that they voted for Joe Biden was because he's not Donald Trump. And that's a, that's a very reasonable case. I mean, uh, between uh, Trump and Biden, uh, only one of them has tried to overturn a U.S. election. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, this doesn't mean that I am any fan of Joe Biden. Uh, but, you know, Donald Trump does appear to pose a unique threat to to democracy, to the constitutional order, um, and, uh, and uh, it is, uh, it's, it's scary as a, as, as a U.S. citizen and someone who believes in individual liberty and the rule of law that someone like Donald Trump could get any traction at all uh, in, in the U.S. political system. And if you wa- want to know how libertarians approach Donald Trump— I recommend uh, an op-ed in the Washington Post that my boss, our president and CEO at the Cato Institute, Peter Gettler, wrote uh, on the occasion of Donald Trump addressing the Libertarian Party of the United States. The Libertarian Party, which is not a Libertarian Party anymore. It uh, used to be Gary Johnson's party, right? It, if I remember correctly. It did, and there have always been these factions that are – Uh, what you might call alt-right and think that they're libertarian. And one of those factions took over the party. So it's and, alt-right now? And said things like the libertarian party should be open to bigots uh, because we can't really decide what a bigot is. And and so there's nothing libertarian about this approach to to humanity, to to politics, to public policy. Uh, uh, this, this, this organization, you know, I might agree with some members of the Libertarian Party leadership on some issues, but on that fundamental issue of uh, the equal rights and dignity for all, we, we, we appear not to have, we appear not to agree. And so this is not a Libertarian Party. And what my uh, uh, what what our president and CEO explained was that Trump is not a libertarian. That party is not a libertarian. It's definitely a libertarian. We believe in individual uh, liberty and the equal dignity of all human beings, as well as the rule of law. Uh, and uh, Donald Trump appears to want to dispense with that in any number of ways, not just with, uh, not just by ignoring or trying to overturn the clear results of an election. But also uh, by uh, uh, trying to, I mean, he, uh, well, I won't get into the, the long list of, uh, of ways t- that he's uh, tried to subvert the rule of law. But uh, I'll just return to what I said before, which is, I wish we had better choices. I uh, wish, that, that would be my wish for you as well. But let's turn into, into the uh, next topic and the main topic, which, which is self-care. Yesterday, I attended your, your lecture, which, which was organized by, by Ines and Martin Wachinski, who is uh, sitting in the, in the backstage. 
So thanks to Ines for bringing you in and thank you for, for coming. They have been also, wonderful. Uh, thank also, you for having me. Yeah. Oh, my, my pleasure. Uh, there are a lot of myths in Slovak, in Slovak uh, healthcare, but uh, uh, once I was listening to, to your speech, I found out that we are maybe similar also in a way, Slovakia and the United States. There are also a lot of myths in, uh, in the United States. So if you could shortly explain or, or briefly, if it is possible, how does the United States healthcare works and what are the differences, the main differences between maybe the European healthcare system, they are diverse, uh, comparing with the United States healthcare system. So I think the greatest trick that advocates of socialized medicine ever played was to convince the world that the United States does not have it. The United States not only has socialized medicine, it has every variety of socialized medicine that you will find elsewhere in the world and maybe one or two that no one else has invented, that no one we've innovated in the area of socializing medicine. So most of the American uh, population, the U.S. population, has health insurance through an employer much like uh, compulsory health insurance through an employer, much like the German system. Uh, about a sixth of the popular or about 70 million people have health insurance through a Canadian style uh, government program, which we call Medicaid, where the national government sends money to the states and then they run programs. It's ostensibly just for the poor. So it's not the entire population like in Canada, but the the, the structure of the program is very similar. Uh, uh, another 60 or 70 million people have health insurance through, uh, well, let me get back to that 60 or 70 million. We, we also have a version, our own version of the British National Health Service. It covers about 1% of the U.S. population that are veterans of the U.S. military. It is what we call a fully integrated system where the government plays the role of it, it and the insurer as well as it owns the hospitals, it employs the doctors and so forth. So they all work for the same entity, much like the British National Health Service. There's nothing inherently socialist about that model. We also have a private sector version of that in the United States. We may get to that. Uh, but we also have uh, healthcare markets like uh, the Swiss and uh, markets in Switzerland and in the Netherlands uh, that some people call managed competition. In the United States, we call it Obamacare, where you have some measure of competition between heavily regulated and heavily subsidized private insurers. That covers about 10 to 20 million people. But where we've innovated is with the U.S. Medicare program that covers about uh, 60 to 70 million. I mentioned this group before. This is a totally government-run system where the, the, the national government provides health insurance to 66 million people, sets the prices for billions of transactions across this massive uh, uh, market, uh, and, uh, writes checks directly to doctors and hospitals. There is no country in the world, no insurance scheme in the world that can match the Medicare program in terms of, uh, size and scope. Uh, it, it, it especially if you measure in terms of uh, the dollars spent, Medicare is the largest purchaser of medical services in the world, even though it only covers a fraction of the United States population. And uh, and yet within the Medicare program, we also have a version of managed competition, not unlike what you have here in Slovakia, where private insurers compete against a government-run plan. And then we have uh, some people who are in both the U.S. version of the Canadian system and the Medicare program who get coverage from uh, both. That's also unique uh, on, on this planet. And then we do have about 8% of the population who have no health insurance. Now, so the health insurance is not mandatory. You can decide if you want to have one, or but you also have a possibility not to have health insurance one at all. Well, it is mandatory. It is. Uh, first of all, it's mandatory that you pay your taxes to support all these government schemes. Got it. Whether you enroll in health insurance or not is also mandatory. If you are a taxpayer, if you earn any income at all, then there is an implicit penalty. The government doesn't call it a penalty, but there is an implicit penalty if you take that money and don't buy health insurance with, mm -hmm. with your earnings. Uh, the government creates... We are forced to buy some sort of the health insurance only by the fact that you are employed or you are employer, right? Yes, because if your employer, the way it works is if your employer gives you a dollar of income in the form of cash, well, if the, a dollar of income in the form of health insurance, let's start there, there are no taxes on that uh, expenditure. Mm -hmm. You have to let your employer control that money and let them choose your health plan. 
but you don't pay taxes on that compensation. If your employer takes that same dollar and gives it to you as cash, then on average, you have to pay uh, a marginal rate of uh, marginal tax rate of 33%. Now, that's just income taxes and payroll taxes. And so we don't label that 33% a, a penalty for not purchasing insurance. But economically, functionally, it is identical to a penalty for not purchasing health insurance. So that's what makes it mandatory. As mandatory, uh, if it's even more compulsory than the the explicit mandate that Obamacare enacted and that Congress effectively repealed. And so uh, so the uninsured, if they're earning income, are paying that penalty. They, they are, they're paying higher taxes mm -hmm. than the people who are enrolling in employer-sponsored insurance. But there is still a possibility just to refuse to have a health insurance. But if, the penalty for it is that is you are yes. paying high, uh, higher taxes. Yes. Much like in, in, in other countries, if you pay the penalty, then you, you can go without health insurance. I'm not sure if in Slovakia it is even possible not to have a uh, health insurance unless you give up on your, uh, you know, permits to or on yeah, it's sort of a permit that you are actively living in Slovakia. Then you have to have a health insurance unless you, you different countries go about it in different ways. In the United States, you not only have to pay that 33% penalty, <clears throat> you might have to pay an even larger one because if you if your employer offers you health insurance. Uh, that employer is typically spending five to seven thousand dollars of your compensation on that health insurance mm -hmm. and won't give it to you. Uh, so, uh, if you decline the health insurance, they won't give it to you as cash because the tax laws basically forbid it. And so you're paying more than a 33% penalty. You're paying a hundred percent penalty on that amount. And that is, uh, 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 again, the functional equivalent of a mandate to purchase health insurance. Uh, if you did not, uh, if they gave you that cash and you refused to pay the 33% implicit penalty, then there would not only be, uh, th then the government would come in after you with additional fines and potentially jail time. So you can refuse to enroll in health insurance. Uh, at, and if you pay the penalty, then the government will leave you alone. But if you refuse to pay the penalty, the government will come after you. How does uh, health insurance in the United States generally works? What does it cover? How, how how are people deciding which insurance plan they are going to choose or which insurance company are they going to be, uh, become the client of, et cetera? So most of the population does not have a choice. Mm -hmm. The employer chooses for them. And even if the employer offers multiple health insurance plans, it's usually uh, the high and low option from a single insurer. So most people who have employer-sponsored insurance, and that's most of the U.S. population, don't have a choice between competing insurers. Why? Because employer that's very expensive for employers to administer. Mm -hmm. And this, this what, what you can call a tax preference for employer-sponsored insurance or a tax penalty on people who want to choose their insurance themselves came about by accident. No one in the national government decided, hey, let's create a tax break or an implicit penalty on uh, on uh, a tax break for employer-sponsored insurance or an implicit penalty on health insurance choice back when this penalty took effect in the early part of the 20th century. There wasn't even health insurance in 1913 when Congress created the income tax or in the 1920s when the Treasury bureaucrats decided to create this, this tax preference. It just sort of emerged and then grew over time and people came to accept the idea of employer-sponsored insurance, even though it is terrible, low quality insurance. And now people are so dependent on it. Uh, the healthcare sector is so dependent on it. Employers, large employers benefit from it so much because uh, it, it helps them compete against their smaller competitors in the labor market that no one wants to, that very few, that no one in the healthcare industry and very few employers want to change it. And, and that is why we have so little choice now, if you look at other parts of the health insurance marketplace, if you look at Obamacare, which uh, which sort of regulated a market that was already there, in that market that was already there covered 10, 20 million people, uh, you had considerable choice. The consumer could choose their insurance company. They could... They had a lot of choices among insurance plans that covered varying... Uh, types of services and uh, with varying levels of deductibles and other cost sharing uh, on the part of the enrollee. So you had considerable choice there. And in that small corner of the U.S. health sector, 
We saw remarkable innovations that made health insurance more secure for the sick than employer-sponsored insurances. And that, that, that even began filling in the cracks of the employer-sponsored system because one of the features of employer-sponsored insurance is you lose it when you change jobs. And that often happens after people get sick. And so people would lose their health insurance because the plant closed or because they moved to another town or their employer just started, stopped dropping coverage or they divorced or their spouse died or they retired. And then the conditions, the medical conditions that they had developed, which should have been, which should have continued to be insured conditions, became uninsured and uninsurable pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. So to, so that's what I mean when I say that employer-sponsored insurance is terrible insurance. The government decided to favor, compel people to enroll in terrible insurance because it leaves, it, 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 it exacerbates the problem of pre-existing conditions where people are already sick and then need to go buy a new health insurance plan. So what, what happens, you know, uh, you lose your job or you get the worst, et cetera, et cetera, or uh, you get retired because once you are retired, you do not have employer. Uh, you are not employed anymore. So... Uh, does those people have uh, insurance or they are paying it by themselves? When when Congress created the Medicare program for elderly people in 1965, Medicare provides health insurance, that's that 66 million people, uh, To it provides health insurance to 99% of the eligible elderly population. It did that. So the government is paying the for The government insurance? is paying for it. Uh, it did that because for 40 years, the government had been penalizing cradle-to-grave health insurance that you could buy from an insurance company. When Congress enacted the Medicare program in 1965, there were 70-some private insurance companies who would provide coverage uh, that would cover you until death, into retirement until death. And But the problem was the government had been penalizing them. Uh, so For what reason? Be, it was a, it was that that historical accident that I mentioned. The government mm -hmm. created the income tax, and and in implementing it, they decided to exempt or exclude employer sponsored health insurance from taxation, and that created that implicit but very real penalty that I talked about that discouraged people from that penalized people for if they bought if they took that compensation as cash and used it to buy coverage that, that stayed with them between jobs that let them pay healthy person premiums all the way into retirement, no matter how sick they got. And so, so this, this problem that we have in the United States of preexisting conditions where, uh, where people would lose their coverage and not be able to afford it anymore was a problem that go the government either entirely created or, uh, or vastly exacerbated. And that, that small market of 10 to 20 million people was solving that problem. It was not only providing that cradle-to-grave coverage that I mentioned, but it was also filling in the gaps of employer-sponsored insurance so that when you lost your employer-sponsored insurance, you just, you weren't left uninsured. But in 2020 or 2014, Obama outlawed all of those innovations uh, and reformed that market. So now we have a Swiss or Dutch-style Market. You would have to explain what the Obamacare is because we heard about it a lot, but it's 10 years ago. So a lot of people doesn't remember or right. don't know so anymore. Obamacare, so Obamacare was a thousand page law with lots and lots of provisions in it. But the two main things that it did to expand health insurance was to transform that market from a reasonably free market that was innovating and making health insurance more secure Uh, than it was before or more secure than employer-sponsored insurance. Obamacare outlawed all of that and uh, and began to regulate that market heavily by requiring people to purchase coverage they didn't want, by imposing so price... It became mandatory. Well, yes. It included a mandate that required people to buy some form of insurance. Uh, it It imposed price controls on health insurance plans that penalize insurers if they provide quality care to the sick. Again, these are not explicit penalties. These are implicit penalties, but they are very real as well. Uh, they exist here where, in Slovakia where you have price regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, and the government created a risk equalization program to try to eliminate those penalties. And it's not really working. They still exist. And so 
uh, what a, so that was one large coverage expansion in Obamacare. The other one was the expansion of that Canadian style program in the United States, the Medicaid program, uh, uh, where uh, now 40 states, uh, 40 out of 50 states have implemented that part of Obamacare. And so when I'm talking about Obamacare and uh, its effect on private insurance, what I'm mostly talking about is its imposition of a Swiss or Dutch style health insurance scheme or health mm-hmm. insurance a regulatory scheme in that 10% of the pri- uh, U.S. market for private health insurance. And uh, one of the uh, of the statements I think it was in Washington Post that you are the person who could take down the the Obamacare, as far as I remember. So that was Vox had that headline. Okay, okay. And it was a very flattering headline, and I appreciated them for that. They they were referring to work that I did, showing that Congress allowed states and intended to allow states to block certain parts of Obamacare. I mentioned that. It imposed this Swiss or Dutch style system on, <clears throat> on on the uh, on the private individual market uh, in the United States. Part of that system is hev- regulation, but also heavy subsidies to help people afford the f- very expensive regulations that the the, the law imposed. And r- Congress actually gave states the power to block those regulations, and and intended Any to do them. so. To block, I'm sorry, not to block those regulations, to block those subsidies, mm-hmm. to block the subsidies, all of the subsidies. And it was very clear in the in the legislation, the Supreme Court, the, the, there was a case that litigated uh, this question. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme, Supreme Court said, yeah, that's what the law says, but we're going to do something else anyway. So because of the role I played in encouraging states to block those parts of Obamacare and doing the legal research to show Yes, yeah, that's what the law says, and that's what Congress intended. That enabled the Supreme Court case to happen. Uh, that's why Vox said that I am the man who could take down Obamacare. But the Supreme Court uh, broke with what the law says, and they even admitted that they broke with what the law says, uh, which was a, a terrible tragedy, travesty that I will uh, I will probably never get over. Uh, uh, but it was a very flattering headline uh, that I got from Vox. Definitely. Uh, you have to, <clears throat> have to explain or, or demonstrate some other myths that people in Europe uh, know or doesn't know about about the healthcare system in the United States. What do you, uh, what would you emphasize on? Sure. So uh, the the biggest one we've already touched on is that the the U.S. health sector is a free market. It's not remotely free, as our prior dis- discussion uh, explained. There's we, ha- we have every form of socialized medicine in the United States that anyone has ever invented and some that no other na- nation have, eh, has adopted. And for further proof that the U.S. health sector is not a free market, we can look to the OECD. They collect data, lots and lots of data on all the advanced nations' health systems. Uh, and the one metric that they publish that gets the least amount of attention, I think, but deserves the most attention, is what share of health spending in each country is voluntary versus compulsory. So Mm -hmm. voluntary meaning the government doesn't push you one way or another. You have free choice between this option, that option, between spending on healthcare, whether and how you spend that money on healthcare, versus how much of a nation's health spending is compulsory. In other words, Either the government taxes that money and spends it itself, and those taxes are compulsory, or private spending that the government penalized, where the government penalizes you if you don't spend it the way the government wants. The OECD finds that not only is uh, does the United States have a very high share of, uh, uh, of its health spending that is compulsory, it is among the highest shares in the OECD. 85% of health spending in the United States is compulsory. That is just two percentage points behind the highest share in the OECD, which is Germany at 87%. And the United States at 85% is in a statistical tie with France, Czechia, Denmark, and Norway. These are all nations that most people would agree have a socialized system And the OECD is saying that government has as much control over health spending in the United States 
as government does in France, Czechia, Denmark, and Norway. And the United States or government in the United States controls more health spending than governments in uh, in the United Kingdom, where it controls 81%, and Canada, which is somewhere in the 70s. And these are nations where they have explicitly uh, fully socialized systems, uh, different varieties, but where uh, uh, the, the systems are not only fully socialized, but there's no cost sharing or, or, or vanishingly uh, small, small levels of cost sharing. And yet government still controls a larger share of health and spending in the United States than in these fully socialized countries. So that should, right there, should completely shatter the myth that the U.S. has a free market in healthcare. Uh, as far as I know, and as far as I remember from your lecture, is that the United States is spending around 16 or 70 percent of GDP on healthcare. Is that correct? About 16.6, yes. 16.6. Uh, uh, but uh, you're spending a really a lot of money on Which healthcare. Which is vastly more than any yeah. other nation. But is it efficient system? Is it effective system? So uh, it, it's really hard to know. Uh, it, I think it's important to note that 14 percentage points of that 16.6%, uh, so 14% of U.S. GDP is compulsory health spending, where the, the government w will penalize taxpayers if they uh, if they don't spend their money on healthcare. 14% of GDP is a larger share of GDP than any other nation spends on healthcare in total, voluntary and compulsory combined. So if you want to know why does the U.S. spend so much more than other nations on healthcare, it's as a share of GDP, it's because our government compels us to do so. Is it efficient to spend that much money? Probably not, but it's really hard to tell. If you look at Uh, the evidence, there's lots of evidence that the U.S. health sector is uh, is wasting vast amounts of money. So look at the U.S. Medicare program. The best research available suggests that this trillion-dollar program spends about $300 billion dollars every year on medical services, goods and services, that don't do anything to improve the patient's health and don't do anything to make the patient any happier, any more satisfied with the medical care they receive. That means it is pure waste. It is just a transfer from taxpayers to doctors and hospitals and pharmaceutical companies that do, don't do anything to benefit the patient along the way. So that is incredibly inefficient and there are lots of other inefficiencies in the U.S. health sector. At, at the same time, Uh, one of the maybe two things the U.S. health sector has going for it is that we are an engine of innovation. We develop more new tests, new treatments, and cures than all uh, than any other nation, and, and by some measures, by all other nations, right. more than all other nations combined. One of those is, uh, for example, a cure for hepatitis C, a drug called Sofosbuvir or Sovaldi. Sovaldi cures 95 or more... Uh, 95% or more of the people, who, uh, of the uh, hepatitis C patients who take it. It reduces all-cause mortality among hepatitis C patients by 50%. It is saving lives, but it's not saving lives just in the United States. It's also saving lives around the world. And so if you want to me measure the efficiency of the U.S. health sector, you have to look at all of the inefficiencies that we can document that we know exist within the U.S. health sector. But we also have to measure the efficiencies that we're generating in the terms of new medical innovations that save lives here and save lives abroad. Because right now in most international comparisons, we're crediting the NHS. We're crediting the Slovak system with the efficiencies of, of, of Savaldi that is, that is, that is yep. saving lives. Those belong to the United States. Uh, I have not seen anyone try to uh, try to capture and credit to the or, or originating nation all of the efficiencies from the medical innovations that they develop, and that's uh, an overview of why it's so, so difficult to answer the question of is the U.S. health sector inefficient? It probably could be more efficient, but a lot of people don't credit it with. Uh, all of the efficiencies that it you say that basically by the development, you're also subsidizing the world by the by the new treatment yep. and, new, and new drugs. And the ridiculously high prices that we pay in the United States for pharmaceuticals is uh, is an implicit subsidy, uh, not just of, uh, of of for patients in other nations, but but 
taxpayers and government run health systems in other nations. It is the contribution that the United States, the United States consumers and taxpayers make to socialized medicine in other countries. Yeah, it's a little bit similar also with the, with the you know, uh, army industry because the United States is, is uh, protecting Europe and saving yes. Europe as yes. Few There, ta- a few times in a decade. Sort of, uh, uh, a similar dynamic. In, in it, is. Yeah. it is. It uh, is. Also, during uh, your lecture, you've been, you've been advocating that one of the problems of the of the U.S. health market is not that it is free, but the opposition, that they, there are too many regulations. Uh, you've been also showing the charts uh, regarding the lobbying groups. And the lobby <laughs> group in the healthcare was was mu- like four times bigger than the army, army lobbying. So, and you've been mentioning that a lot of healthcare companies uh, or insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera, are fighting against free market, not advocating it because they are benefit, uh, ben- uh, benefiting from it. Was it correct? So the federal, the national government in the United States requires people who lobby Congress, the national legislature, Uh, to p- report how much money they are spending lobbying Congress. Mm-hmm. And for the past 20 years or more, the one industry that has outspent every other industry, usually by far, on lobbying Congress is healthcare. It spends uh, six times the amount that the defense industry spends lobbying healthcare. And remember, the defense industry enriches a lot of defense contractors. They want an expansive U.S. military. They want a, a, a an adventurous, uh, interventionist U.S. foreign policy. They spend lots and lots of money, $200 million dollars per year or, or almost. In uh, Well, it's not $200 million. It's, it's like $136 in, in 2023 to encourage Congress to expand – to increase spending on the U.S. military. The health sector of the economy spends six times as much as the defense industry does. And the pharmaceutical sector alone spends about 2.7 times as much as the defense industry does lobbying Congress. Now, this is a puzzle. If the U.S. has a free market in health care, why does the health Why does the healthcare industry spend so much money lobbying Congress? Is it because does we have a free market and they want to keep it a free market? Vice versa. Probably, probably not. What that indicates is that the government already has so much control over the health sector that the industry wants to capture those powers that the government has and use that, use those powers to their benefit, and they do it very well. They fight against cuts in the Medicare program or, or other government subsidies. They fight to install or preserve regulations that uh, that uh, enrich incumbent hospitals and uh, and doctors and health insurance companies at the expense of new entrants into the, into the market and uh, and and they do it very well because those those uh, and they also lobby to pr- protect the tax policies that we were describing pr- before that, that penalize you unless you spend your money on health insurance mm-hmm. and health care and they've been very good over the decades at protecting all of these government interventions uh, and and blocking cuts so good that when congress passed obamacare in 2020 over the first 10 full uh, 10 years of full operation that the projections were that that law would spend 2 trillion dollars 2 trillion dollars in new government subsidies for healthcare They paid for half of it with tax increases, so a trillion dollars in tax increases, but they paid for the other half by reducing the rate of growth of Medicare spending, okay? Medicare is that incredibly inefficient program that wastes a third of its budget, uh, so there's plenty of room to cut. They didn't cut anywhere near a third of Medicare spending, but the only way they were able to overcome industry opposition to that trillion dollars worth of cuts was by promising the industry $2 trillion dollars of new subsidies. So that is how entrenched the healthcare industry is, that the only way Congress can bring just a little bit of efficiency out of the Medicare program is by creating even more efficiency and subsidizing uh, an inefficient health sector even more. What would have to happen in order to have uh, less expensive healthcare in the United States? Because uh, we've heard about the stories, for example, insulin, 
you know, for the for the diabetes that is much more expensive in the United States than in Canada, and not not even comparing with the with the European countries. So, w- which steps has to be taken in order to get healthcare to be maybe more affordable, or if not more affordable, then in a better quality uh, for for the citizens? There are lots and lots of things that state governments and the national government in the United States do that increase health care prices, regulatory policies, tax policies, uh, uh, government subsidies that all drive prices higher. And that's what the industry is trying to protect with all of that lobbying expenditure, their, their high prices. So if you want to get those prices down, you need to change a lot of regulations and a lot of tax policies. Change or cancel? Uh, I would prefer cancel. Uh, uh, that's my idea of change because these regulations, these regulations were never needed. They reduce the quality of care. They increase prices. We should get. Rid we of them. say that in general, regulations makes uh, healthcare in the United States less affordable and more expensive. Yes, yes, clearly so. If you look at Obamacare's regu- uh, 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 premium regulations for health insurance, they cause health insurance premiums to skyrocket, double or triple for many people. Or, or if you look at a part of Obamacare that requires people to buy 100% coverage for prescription contraceptives, that uh, that law uh, uh, takes away your freedom to choose a different uh, health plan that doesn't cover them or or has cost sharing. And prior to that uh, that that mandate taking effect, prices for prescription contraceptives and uh, were falling relative to inflation. But when it took effect, those prices skyrocketed because the manufacturers of those products knew that th- their customers would no longer switch to a less competitive or a, a less expensive product and that they, they had the insurance companies over a barrel. And so they just raised their prices. So regulations in- clearly increase prices. Tax policy, uh, the the the, the the penalties on uh, on uh, on controlling your own health insurance dollars and decisions those increase prices and government subsidies increase prices so uh, there are two main ways two uh, uh, two types of policy changes that you need to make in the United States to get prices down and the most important one I would argue by far is to change who controls the spending so that it's not government and employers controlling 85% of that spending, but that the consumer controls that spending. And you can still subsidize uh, poor people and sick people to, to make sure they have enough. Uh, in fact, my my proposal to reform the U.S. Medicare program is the same as my proposal to reform the Slovak health system, which is take the money that the government was giving to the insurance companies, where it's giving insurance companies a higher payment to cover sick people and just give that money to the patient, let them choose their health insurance plan. Mm-hmm. They will be price conscious in a way that they are that they are not in the United States now or in Slovakia. They will demand price reductions and they will spark price competition from producers. And we've seen, uh, I mean, it, economic theory predicts and there's lots of empirical evidence that shows that consumers cut back on wasteful care and they demand lower prices and they get lower prices when they see the savings, when they are price sensitive. That is the most important thing we can do to get prices down and getting prices down is the most important thing we can do to make healthcare universal. If you want a universal system, you need markets to uh, drive prices down uh, because that is how you bring healthcare within the reach of people who could not afford it yesterday and that is how you make it easier for the rest of us to afford p- providing health care to the smaller number and ever shrinking number of people who still can't afford it. So that's one set of uh, reforms, but that also helps with the other set of, is more important than the other set because it helps to solve the other set of reforms. Once consumers control the money and they see in the the pre the, the the checks they're writing to the insurance companies, the effects of the regulations that drive up their insurance premiums. Once they see the effects of regulations that drive up prices for contraceptives or 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 other items, they then they will vote to demand that uh, the legislature eliminate those regulations that are increasing prices. If those regulations are increasing uh, the, the their tax burden, and then that. Those costs, those higher prices are much less salient. If we make them salient to 
consumers, then they will not only be smarter consumers, they'll be smarter voters and they will vote to eliminate those unnecessary So basically you're telling that the health insurance is too important to be run by the government. Uh, it, is too, uh, it is too important to be run by government. Uh, and uh, just as price controls are dangerous in every sector of the economy, they are especially dangerous in healthcare and health insurance. Because when the when price controls re, uh, erode the quality of medical care, and that's what Slovakia's price controls on health insurance are doing right now, uh, the the consequence is not that you go without some luxury that we would otherwise be able to afford, or, or or you suffer a slightly lower quality of uh, uh, quality of life. You may lose your life because. The government is penalizing insurers who provide you quality health insurance and medical care. Michael, thank you for coming. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.